Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Um, I just uh, wanted to do a very quick review of what we read actually only last week, which was a lot of murders, right? A lot yeah. of kings, a lot of murders, a lot of coups. Um, I think that that could sum up uh, what yeah. we read last week. Yeah. Unless anyone else has uh, has something to add to that. Okay, so we're going to pick it up at, we're at 2 Kings 16. Um, and Can we say the blessing, Rabbi. We will, yes, we'll say the blessing. But um, I ha I will put that up on the screen. But who who would like to read? Just so I know when I go to the next. I suppose I could. Okay, Lynn. Thank you. All right. So let me get the blessing first. Here we go. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu BeMitzvotav Etzivanu LaAsok BeDivrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot, commanding us to engage with words of Torah. By the way, Jason, um, there's also a blessing to say at the end of the of study, which I've never included. Oh, well, we're not good at ending blessings. We never do the beer cap on my own. We, oh, we... God, please, please. <laughs> but um, no, you know, you know what the ending blessing is? It's the uh, Hatzi Kaddish. Oh, I yeah. didn't know that. That's where it started. The... the the Hatsi or the Kaddish was originally a prayer that was said at the end of study. And it's an Aramaic because in those days that's what people spoke. And then it made its way into the service as punctuation marks, basically, to separate different parts of the service, which you may not notice all that much because the reform movement took a lot of them out. And it wasn't until like the, the medieval period that it became uh, a prayer for the dead. And there's a whole legend around that, around uh, Rabbi Akiva, but we won't go into that right now. Okay, so let me get, yeah, hang on Oh, a now I'm curious about. <laughs> now you're, <laughs> I should have said that, right? I should, okay. So there's a story about Rabbi Akiva who goes to, um, he goes into a, a graveyard and he sees his ghost working really, really hard. And he says to the ghost, why are you working so hard? He said, I was a really bad man. Um, I, I was a tax collector. I wasn't nice to people. And I got a woman pregnant. And I don't even know if it was a boy or a girl. Well, you know, you're supposed to teach Torah to your son. So Rabbi Good Akiva. Good morning, you guys. Oh. <laughs> so Rabbi Akiva finds the kid. Of course, it's a son. And he teaches him Torah. And when the son goes to synagogue and says something like, the Kaddish, which is basically just a praise of God. It's just like a lot of synonyms for praising God. When he does that, the father's soul is released, which is why we say the Kaddish for our parents for a year, right? So that's that's the story. It's apocryphal, no doubt. And by the way, if you want to know a lot about the Kaddish, there's a book called Kaddish by Leon Wieseltier. Yeah. who was the um, literary editor of the New Republic. And he, uh, his father died and he was never very observant, but he decided he wanted to do the cottage three times a day. So he did massive amounts of research into the whole issue of the cottage and where it came from. Of course, he did not do any footnotes or anything because he's the great Leon Visa least here. So <laughs> why put footnotes? It's kind of like Maimonides, who, when quoting the sages of the past, why bother doing that? Let me just tell you what the law is, you know? Th those are things that uh, don't, don't go over very well most of the time. Um, okay, so now you know everything about the Kaddish, and if you want more, I think the, the book is 700 pages. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> I made it through half that book, and at Etzadar, the rabbi at the time, Rabbi Sean, uh, she said, you you went through half. He said I didn't even get that far. All right, it, it's <laughs> yeah. I don't think I I ever got through the entire thing, but it's interesting. It's got some interesting stuff in there, you know, research wise. Um, so why do they have to have a minion for that prayer? You do have to have a minion. Yes. Yeah, you do. And have to have a minion. wasn't he going to an Orthodox synagogue? He, yeah, well, guess so. why? Guess why? Yeah. yeah. Because if he wants to do the cottage three times a day, where else is and he going to do it? It's the only place he can do it. Exactly. 
Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to now share 2 Kings 16. We just read last time that Ahaz was taking over in Judah. As you noticed, a lot of the king's names are very similar. Yeah. You know, it's very confusing, which is why I gave you that chart. Not that that necessarily completely helps, but anyway. Okay, Lynn. Okay. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Ramaliah, King Ahaz, son of Jotham of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord his God, as his ancestor David had done. But he walked in the way of kings of, of the kings of Israel. He even made his son pass fire according to the abominable, abom, I can't do that, yeah, practices <laughs> of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. He sacrificed and made offerings on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. Then King Rezin of Aram and King Pekah, son of Ramalia of Israel, came up to wage war on Jerusalem. They besieged Ahaz, but could not conquer him. At that time, King Rezin of Aram covered Elath for Edom and drove the Judeans from Elath, and the Edomites came to Elath, where they live to this day. Ahaz sent messengers to King Tilglath, Pelisir of Assyria, saying, I am your servant and your son. Come up and rescue me from the hand of the king of Aram and from the hand of the king of Israel who are attacking me. Ahaz also took the silver and gold found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house and sent a present to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria listened to him. The king of Assyria marched up against Damascus and took it carrying his people captive to care, then he killed Rezin. When okay, they, yep. So let's just stop for one sec. Thank you. I'm sorry for all those difficult names in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so first of all, the uh, verse eight. Well, oh, putting, putting the kid through the fire, by the way. Um, it's not clear whether it was a sacrifice that was done to Moloch or if that was some kind of metaphorical or symbolic thing, it's not entirely clear, but certainly, you know, there was child sacrifice in the ancient Near East in those days. Um, so verse, okay, we didn't get to verse 10 yet. Okay, no. so basically what, um, you know, what the king is doing here is he's paying tribute to the king of Assyria um, because, you know, what is he gonna do? Uh, he's he's uh, trying to, to keep from getting conquered. So, um, you know, this whole period that we've been reading about in the last few weeks is really a period of time when it wasn't really a sovereign nation, that Israel and Judah were not really sovereign nations. They were really um, paying tribute to bigger, bigger fish. And, um, you know, there's this constant effort from all around to conquer that land or to get to to use it to get through to the next land. Like if you're from Mesopotamia, you're gonna to wanna to conquer Egypt and you have to go through Israel for that and vice versa. So it was always a very difficult spot geographically um, with people trying to conquer each other all the time. Okay. When King Ahaz went to Damascus to meet King Tilgrath Pileser of Assyria, he saw the altar that was at Damascus. King Ahaz sent to the priest Uriah, a model of the altar and its pattern exact in all its details. The well, let me stop you just one second, because I, I one thing I want to also point out was, look look what Ahaz has to do to pay tribute. He's taking silver and gold from the temple, right? I mean, he's taking his own treasure and all of that too, but, you know, that's like beyond, you know, being a, a vassal to uh, the Assyrian king. I mean, he's like pillaging the temple for that. So that's like really, really bad. Um, and now the priest of uh, Assyria is going to show him the model of an altar that he's going to have to build, which again, very bad transgression. Maybe they didn't have a choice, but they're you know building altars to other gods here. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, the priest Uriah built the altar in accordance with all that King A has had sent from Damascus, so did the priest Uriah build it before King Ahaz, or King, oh, I got the wrong line, before King Ahaz 
viewed the altar. Then the king drew near to the altar, went up on it, and offered his burnt offerings and his grain offering, poured his drink offering, and dashed the blood of his offerings of well-being against the altar. The bronze altar that was before the Lord, he removed from the front of the house, from the place between his altar and the house of the Lord, and put it on the north side of his altar. King Ahaz commanded the priest Uriah, saying, Upon the great altar offering this morning, burnt Okay, upon the great altar, offer this morning burnt offering and the evening grain offering and the king's burnt offering and his grain offering with the burnt offering of all the people of the land, their grain offering and their drink offering. Then dash against it all the blood of the burnt offering and all the blood of the sacrifice that the bronze altar shall be for me to inquire by. The priest Uriah did everything that King Ahaz commanded. That's confusing. Okay, so... Um... He's building an altar based on the um, the altar in Assyria. However, speaking of altars, Robert Alter says, uh, it says, um, Ahaz sent to Uriah the priest the image of the altar and its design in all its fashioning. In the present instance, this is not an attempt to adapt pagan practice. For the narrator makes no critical comment and the new altar erected in Jerusalem is adapted for the cult of yud heh vav -Heh, and not subsequently destroyed. Instead, Ahaz, a provincial monarch, comes to the metropolis of Damascus, where, as a kind of cultic tourist, he sees and marvels at the large and impressive altar constructed according to the most modern design, and he decides to adopt it for his own temple. Um, that, that's Alter's viewpoint. Um, I mean, I kind of think of um you know the the idea that flattery is the highest yeah. form i mean imitation is the highest form of flattery right so he sees this beautiful altar and the king is coming to visit so he wants to say hey you know we got a similar altar because we really admire yours and we're going to have one that looks just like yours um because you know they, they talk about the fact uh where is it Bef um so did so the priest uh, Uriah built it before King Ahaz arrived from Damascus. So to me, that sounds like, you know, I want to get it done as soon as he comes so that I can impress him with how beautiful this altar is. And then it's just like his. Yeah, Jane. Isn't Uriah a Hittite name? Well, it certainly was a Hittite name when it was uh, uh, Bacheva's. Yeah. Do you um, know anything about this priest other than what we're being told here? No. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. Just so, wonder because well, you, you see that so many life. people. Yeah, you see that so many people have similar names, right? And mm -hmm. it gets so confusing. Um, but we're going to see this is going to be the end of the Northern Empire at this point. Oh yeah. All right. If you have, Lynn, if you don't mind completing okay. this chapter. Okay, then King Ahaz cut off the frames of the stands and removed the laver from them. He removed the sea from the bronze oxen that were under it and put it on a pediment of stone. The covered portal for use on the Sabbath that had been built inside his palace and the outer entrance for the king he removed from the house of the Lord. He did this because of the king of Assyria. Now the rest of the acts of Ahaz that he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Ahaz slept with his ancestors and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son Hezekiah succeeded him. So, you know, what you get, you get this image here of, again, the king just, you know, stripping everything he can from the temple to get, you know, precious metals or whatever he needs to get to pay tribute to Assyria. And uh, guess what? It's not going to work, but I don't want to give you any spoiler spoilers. Um, but now that we've, let me just uh, stop one sec. Now that we've had uh, all these different kings that, that we, let me just, okay. Now that we've had all these different kings that, um, you know, have done things that were abominable to God, we're going to get, one of the only two kings that the Bible really admires beyond David, right? King David is like the primo guy, even though he was far from perfect. Um, but there are two kings that are like the model kings for the Bible. 
So anybody know who they are? Just offhand. Okay, Christine, you're you're muted. So I'm thinking Solomon. Oh, well, Solomon, yeah, yeah, but he's never, it's never like, oh, this king wasn't as good as Solomon, right? I mean, it's always he wasn't as good as David. Yeah, okay. Okay, well, if you don't know, it's okay, you'll find out in the next chapter, because that's what we're going to read now. Um, who would like to, uh, yeah, vassal states, exactly, Jane. That's Rabbi, what. I have a question. Please. What's the C? What's the what? The C from the altar. The C from the altar? At the very beginning. Yeah. I'm thinking this must, section. Must well, I have to go back and look. Decorations or... At the beginning? No. At the beginning the of that paragraph. The end. Oh, at the end? Oh. Yeah. He Second. removed the C from oh, the Oh, that's box. weird. That's a good yeah. question. Um, let Maybe me it was a, a sort of a visual thing, a picture that says decoration, you know, like the C with the something over it. I don't what know. What verse is that? Um, 17. 17. Uh -huh. Let me see, let me just see what this guy does. King A has cut off the. Okay, this is how uh, Alter translates it. And then I know you guys all have different books like Jewish Study Bible. So we'll see if there's a different translation. But this is the way he translates it. And King Ahaz cut off the frames of the laver stands and removed the lavers from them and took down the basin from the bronze oxen that were beneath it and set it oh, on the stone. The basin, okay. It's probably okay. a basin, but I don't know why they call it a sea of all things. Okay, Christine, go ahead. I think it's because it was salt water. Yeah, that, but uh, I mean, it's a basin that contains It's a water. basin with, with salt water in it. Yeah. Yeah. it must be a reminder of something that it's a weird translation um yeah. uh, mark and mickey do you oh shoot i cannot believe i just did that mark and mickey do you what's the translation you have for verse 17 well uh my book says that uh, the hebrew they removed a, a tank uh, from the oxen a tank yeah interesting uh okay i i I just lost the uh, Bible for a minute. Okay, I have it back. Um, okay, it's it's something to do with water, obviously. Why they translate it as sea, I cannot explain. I like your jewelry, Lori. You're, you're muted. Who made it? Look I at this know. nice lump of coral. <laughs> I made it. Okay, I confess. All right, who would like to who would like to read uh, the next part? I will. Okay, great, Lori. All right, so it's let me. It's not know. on my screen. No, I know. I have to share it. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you. All right, this is chapter seventeen. Hosea in Hosea reigns over Israel in the twelfth year of King Ahaz of Judah. Hosea son of Elah, began to reign in Samaria over Israel. He reigned nine years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, yet not like the kings of Israel who were before him. King Shalomance, Meneser of Assyria, came up against him. Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute. But the king of Assyria found treachery in Hosea, for he had sent messengers to king So of Egypt and offered no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria, of Assyria confined him and imprisoned him. So we're getting to the point where um, the north is going to be in trouble very soon. This is going to be the beginning of the exile. Okay. Israel carried captive. Then the king of Assyria invaded all the land and came to Samaria. For three years, he besieged it. Besieged it. In the ninth year of King Hosea, the king of Assyria captured Samaria. He carried the Israelites away to Assyria. He, he placed them in Hala on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the city of the 
Medis. Yeah. Okay. So what's happening here is this is the conquest of the north by the empire of Assyria. Now, you know that Assyria is at this point the strong empire, which will eventually be followed by Babylonia, then by Greece, then by Rome. And Persia is in there before Greece. Okay. So you've got all these different empires vying for this land. And the Assyria has now invaded Samaria, which is another way of saying the north. And, you know, these days when people refer to this, so you've got the West Bank and you've got other people referring to it as Judea and Samaria. OK, because these are the historically this is historically the geography that um, this country had. So. Um, so the, what the Assyrians do is they take the population of the north. Now, I don't know how they managed to do take everybody, but supposedly they took those people and scattered them around and they replaced them with other conquered people. In other words, it wasn't like the Israelites are living in Israel and the emperor of Assyria is ruling over them. OK, they are no longer a people. They have been scattered. And they, you know, it's the 10 lost tribes, whatever, but they, it's never like we can come back and say, oh, here are the remnants. You know, I mean, occasionally people claim to be the remnants, but in, in the South, it was very different. I mean, eventually people get exiled, but um, they are not moved to other places uh, forever. And so this is how the, the North, you know, is completely uh, destroyed. Rabbi? Right. A yeah. lot of them are killed and a lot of them are enslaved, right? Oh, sure. Killed, enslaved, moved to another um, location. Yeah, Christine. If you're a vassal state and you yeah. don't pay your tribute, that is a, a time-honored way in early states of dealing with you, that they take over the place, they scatter you to the four winds. The Inca did it, you know, the a recalcitrant area that didn't pay its tribute. They they did a quarter of the people to the northernmost part of the empire, the southernmost, the the part that was nearest the Amazon, and the the sea coast. They just like fragmented them, and this is something that you find quite a bit in early states for dealing with people who have blown it basically in terms of their vassalage. Okay, thank you, and Jane. It's a very smart move. <laughs> Because when you scatter the people, you're not going to have uh, a cohesive revolt. Right. So it's, it's a brilliant move. Exactly. Um, if you can you know, do it. it. It does show the strength for strategy. of strategy. It's brilliant. Of course, the way the Bible is going to um, interpret this is this is punishment for all the sins of the country of Israel. Right? No other explanation. That in Syria is essentially the uh hand of god so you know this is how god punishes the israelites oh yes, and rabbi Jay. uh when ephron was uh gave his course uh because i took it through another venue uh but all all of these northern jews fled towards the south and um this is the origin of why we get so many conflicting viewpoints mm. in the Bible, in in the Kumash, you know, it's, you know, who's telling the story, the North or the South? Uh, and is the South telling the story uh, because uh, it's triumphant, you know? So that's a layer of uh, reading the Tanakh uh, yes. that we tend to forget. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, as I said, the South is going to be very different, which is why we've survived. Otherwise, there would be no Jews. Because Babylonia handled it differently. Babylonia exiled sort of the elite, but did not force everyone out of there, even though it seems that way if you read Ezra, but it isn't. Um, so, we, you know, and in exile, what was very smart was the creation of a portable religion, okay? So in exile in Babylonia, 
the uh, Torah was edited and and you know offered to the people. So this was a portable document, and the emphasis on Shabbat and on holidays and on various kinds of rituals and prayer. All of these things were developed in response to the loss of the land and the temple and the king. But the North did not really have the opportunity to do that because, as you said, they 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 were scattered and they, you know, it wasn't like a big group of people together necessarily. And of course, they have the example of Exodus. And by the way, there uh, one theory about Exodus, which, you know, may or may not convince you, is that actually it, there was no Exodus out of Egypt. It was the Exodus out of Judah to the north in the beginning when we had, you know, uh, Rehoboam, who was saying, you know, I'm just going to impose more taxes on you and more, uh, you know, work. Um, and so the whole thing about this exile to another place, the Exodus, is actually the story of, of how the, the north became a separate country. And it was sort of retrojected onto the Egyptian story. That's a theory, a theory. <laughs> we don't know. All right. So let's go back to the. Um, all right. Here we go. Verse seven, I think. Yes. This occurred because the people of Israel had sinned against the Lord, their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. They had worshipped other gods and walked in the customs of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel and the customs that the kings of Israel had introduced. The people of Israel did things that were not right against the Lord their God. They built for themselves high places at all towns from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and sacred poles on every high hill and under every green tree. There they made offerings on all the high places as the nations did whom the Lord had carried them away, away before them. They did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. They served idols of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, turn from your evil ways and keep my commandments and my statutes in accordance with the law that I commanded your ancestors and that I sent to you by my servants, the prophets. They would not listen, but were stubborn as their ancestors had been, who did not believe in the Lord, their God. They despised his statutes and his covenants that he had made with their ancestors and the warnings he had given them. They went after false idols and became false. They followed the nations that were around them concerning whom the Lord had commanded them that they should not do as they did. They rejected all the commandments of the Lord their, of the Lord their God and made for themselves cast image of two images of two calves. They made a sacred pole, worshiped all the hosts of heaven and served Baal. Mm -hmm. There you go. They made their sons and their daughters pass through fire, used divination and augury, and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore, the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah alone. So what we have so far is a complete listing of all the sins of Israel right? All the wicked things they did. And again, remember, we're in the section of the prophets. And the main thing that these particular prophets or the writer and or the writer of this section are concerned about is whether or not people are faithful to yud heh vav -Heh. It's not at all about justice, right? Later on, when we get to Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and all those other guys, there's going to be a lot about how you don't treat the widow, the orphan, the stranger, you know, properly. And you, did, you know, you, you were false in your business dealings and all of those things. But in this section with the historical prophets, it's only about not being faithful to God with no moral implications, really. 
There's no nothing here that says because you follow these false gods, you mistreated people. That doesn't seem to be a concern. Christine. I have an idea about the passing through fire um, in the worship of Ishtar and some of the uh, other Near Eastern gods. You walked through fire. That mm -hmm. this was something like you know a bonfire that you walk through, and um, so I, I it may not be a sacrifice of right. children. It may just be that you're making reference to yet another false idol. Right. Is right. that like walking on the the coals that some groups do? I yeah, think, uh, sort of. Except do that fire, yeah. you have to do it a little faster than the coals. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, it is either one or the other, and we're not sure, you know. But I, I but there was a, a you know, children's be, children being sacrificed in those days. We know that from Greek mythology, etc. Yeah, Sherry. Yeah, I have a question about augury, which means predicting the future. Mm -hmm. Is this the first time this has been mentioned in in the Bible or in the? I don't think so. You know what happened? I didn't know it was against is Jewish law. Oh, well, you mean, oh, there's a whole thing about how, well, first of all, there's, there's a thing in uh, the Torah about false prophets, and prophets right. are not actually supposed to be predicting the future. That's not really what their role, their main role is. Right, right. Uh, but, um, yeah, there's, you know, they have the Urim and Tumim. Remember, we talked about that, the breastplate with the little stones in it, and, you know, you throw it to see, you know, should we go to battle or not? I mean, that's completely opposite to having, you know, to, to following good hey vav hey. But there are these remnants that seem to be sort of okay until God notices it and gets really angry. <laughs> Lori. In verse 18, it says something like God removed them from his from him. Does that mean he stopped paying attention to them? Um I don't think it's that. You know, God stopped paying attention, but I think the idea here is that, you know, it's the Assyrians doing this, and frankly, you know, geopolitically, they were much more powerful than the little tiny kingdom of Israel. But it's being interpreted as God, you know, just like it's like you know, I can't even see you, your face at this point. It makes me so upset. Like, get out of here, right? Okay, okay. Melissa. So one thing I've wondered is when did the mitzvot the 613 rules because there is something in them against um, divination because that's yes. how you say it yes when did they come about that was one question and then in the chat i put you know because one of the one of the things that's disturbed to me about these torah readings is just the ruthlessness and lack of decency or justice that's displayed amongst the israelites um so one thing made me wonder if that was, in fact, why there was so much appeal when Jesus, assuming he existed, came along, because that was much more couched in terms of taking care of the poor. And you okay. know. I, I just I want to reiterate that when we get to Isaiah, that's mm -hmm. going to be very different. OK, okay. the whole Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the 10 so-called minor prophets is all about social justice. So, and so um, with the 613, does the 613 the, was the third century um, AD or BC? Yes, it, it's from, um, I, I just actually quickly looked it up. Um, the earliest account of God giving Israel the 613 commandments dates to the third century CE, mm -hmm. found in the Babylonian Talmud in Makot, that's the tractate. 365 negative commands correspond to the number of solar days in a year and 248 positive commands. Hmm. So, I mean, that's just how some people counted it. It doesn't mean that is the correct way, but, and but don't forget that as far as the commandments go, probably half of them have to do with animal sacrifice. Right. Right. You have all, the whole thing in the book of Leviticus about how you're supposed to you know, lay out the the animal and you know what comes first and how to how to layer it. So, um, you know, there's a lot of that in there, which obviously we don't follow anymore. But no, there's definitely a mandate in the Torah as well as in the prophets to treat those who are less fortunate better. 
It's just that this particular section, which is a historical section, and maybe it's because it's a historical section, and maybe it's because the authors are trying to explain why these things happen, right? Because this is written after the fact. And you know, the northern country of Israel was defeated and dispersed. So how do you explain that? Oh, it must be because they were bad. And that's the way it's being explained here. Okay, any other thoughts, comments? Anybody? No? Okay, so let's go back to this. Um, all right. We're on, yeah, there we go. Okay, let's see. Judah. Oh, wait, Judah also, right. Yeah, we're going to have to do 19. Yeah. Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that Israel had introduced. The Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel. He punished them and gave them into the hands of the plunderers until he banished them from his presence. When he had torn Israel from the house of David, they made Jeroboam, son of Nebat, king. Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord and made them commit great sin. The people of Israel continued in all the sins that Jeroboam committed. They did not depart from them until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had foretold through all his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until this day. So, you know, it's sort of like, you know, just get out of my sight. I can't stand you. You just like make me ill, right? That's kind of what the, they're saying here. Okay, so what does he do, the king of Assyria? The king of Assyria brought people from Babylon to Thah, Ava, Hamath, and Sepharim, and placed them in the cities of Samaria in place of the people of Israel. They took possession of Samaria and settled in its cities. When they first settled there, they did not worship the Lord. Therefore, the Lord sent lions among them that killed some of them. <laughs> Wow. Okay. So <laughs> nice God. Area was told the nations that you have carried away and placed in the city of Samaria do not know the law of the God of the land. Therefore, he sent lions among them. They are killing them because they do not know the law of the God of the land. Then the king of Assyria commanded, send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there. Let him go and live there and teach them the law of the God of the land. So one of the priests whom they had carried away from Samaria came and lived in Bethel. He taught them how they should worship the Lord. So as you see here, not only were the people from the north scattered elsewhere, but other peoples were brought in. So you have a mix of a lot of different cultures. And so the original culture is not going to be preserved that way. Um, and the thing about the lions, apparently lions were abundant in ancient Israel. And apparently there are five different terms for lion in Hebrew, in biblical Hebrew. So it's possible that the displacement of population with hunting perhaps in abeyance created the circumstances for an incursion of lions. In any case, the lion attacks seem to be represented as a miraculous intervention against the new inhabitants of Samaria. So again, that this whole displacement issue might have, you know, encouraged lions to show up, and yet it's being understood as a as a punishment of God, which, I mean, I you know, if you think about it, in those days, you, there's a lot of things that they could not explain, so they could say, well, God did this, but it's it's not a very beautiful image of God the way they keep, you know. I'm sorry for laughing. It's okay. It's okay. It's horrible. Yeah. It is. It is well. You know, there are a lot of horrible things. I mean, look, how about the fact that God asked Abraham to sacrifice his kid? And as far as Abraham is concerned, you know, that's that's it. You know, I mean, he's you know, he, he doesn't know God doesn't really mean it. <laughs> yeah, that was the Torah portion for um, our bat mitzvah. Oh God, yeah, yeah. But we ended up focusing, except for one one of the women, we focused on the women in the in the section yeah i know you wrote about hagar yeah 
Okay, Christine, and then I don't know, Melissa, do you have your hand up still or is it is it from before? No. Before. Okay. Uh, um, Christine. I'll get it down. It's okay. Go ahead, um, Christine. Why would the king of Assyria send uh, people to, uh, uh, priests to instruct people in the ways of the Lord? Because apparently what they're thinking is the reason there are these lions there is that the people who were installed in Israel don't know about the cult of yod vav -Hey. And I think in those days they thought of gods as being kind of um, localized. Yeah. So your dog is so cute. <laughs> um, so they, they thought of God as localized. So they're thinking, uh, you know, maybe the reason these lions came along is because we really did not you know, pay proper respect to God. So let's get this priest here and just, I mean, it's not like they're going to get rid of their other pagan cults. Yeah. But they're going to add yud -Hey vav -Hey to placate okay. that particular God. That's how I understand it. If that makes sense. Okay, so we're going to continue with our text. There we go. Um, yeah. But every nation still made gods of it all. It own and put them in the shrines of the high places that the people of Samaria had made, every nation in the cities in which they lived. The people of Babylon made Sukkot, Benoth, and the people of Cuth made Nergal, the people of Hamath made Ashima, the Avavites made Nibhaz and Tarkhah, <laughs> the Sephardites. Farvites burned their children. Oh my God. There in the go. fire of Adram Malak and Anna, Anna Malak, Malak, the gods of Sepharium. They also worshiped the Lord and appointed from among, from among themselves all sorts of priests as priests of the high places who sacrificed for them in the shrines of the high places. So they worshiped the Lord, but also served their own gods after the manner of the nations from among whom they had been carried away. To this day, they continue to practice their customs. You want me to keep going? Yeah, can you hang on just one second? I just want to um, read this to you. So this is, uh, yeah, 34. Oh yeah, finish 34 and then I'll read this note. Okay. Yeah, please. They do not worship the Lord and they do not follow the statues or the ordinance or the law or the commandment that the Lord commanded the children of Jacob, whom he named Israel. Okay, so the whole account of the cultic practices of the Samaritans. So these are Samaritans because they're living in Samaria. Um, as many scholars have inferred, looks suspiciously like the work of a post-exilic Judahite writer promoting a separatist view of the Samaritans, Okay. So in this representation, the population of Sumerio after 721 BCE, which is when um, the North was conquered, was entirely a foreign Im uh, implant. And the cult performed in Sumeria was not a legitimate worship of Yudhe Bhave, but a promiscuous mingling of pagan and Yahwist practices. Historically, this perception may have been wrong, both in regard to the composition of the Samaritan population and in regard to the nature of the cult. So in other words, if, if you want to talk about the Samaritans, who certainly would consider themselves Jewish, uh, and you want to adopt this theory, so it would mean that there's somebody from the South writing, you know, obviously writing the uh, the final history um, and trying to make the Samaritans kind of look bad, like they're not really Jews because they also worship other gods. Um, so, you know, this is all, you know, these stories came from different places, but somebody sat down and edited them. We have to remember that and decided what was going to be included um, to serve a particular purpose, theologically or whatever. Okay, let's try to finish this chapter. The Lord had made a covenant with them and commanded them, thou shalt not worship other gods or bow yourselves to them or serve them or sacrifice to them. But Thou shalt worship the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt with great power and with an outstretched arm. You shall bow yourselves to him and to him you shall sacrifice. The statutes and ordinance and the law and the commandment that he wrote for you, you shall always be careful to observe. You shall not worship other gods, 
You shall not forget the covenant that I have made with you. You shall not worth, worship other gods, but you shall worship the Lord your God. He will deliver you out of the hands of all your enemies. They would not listen, however, but continue to practice their former custom. So these nations worship the Lord, but also serve their carved image. To this day, their children and their children's children continue to do as their ancestors did. Okay, great. Thank you for reading that. I have one question. Yes. What is... What is the direct reference of to this day? To this day. Uh, well, it's supposed to be eternal. Like there's no. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay. Thank you. But again, you know, here you see, you know, if, if this is how they're trying to tar the um, Samaritans as being not, you know, pure worshipers of yod heh They have all these other gods that they worship. So, you know. Later on, if there are any disputes with Samaritans, they can point to this and say, hey, you're not you're not the real thing here. You're not the authentic thing. OK, um, anybody want to read the next chapter? OK, first Christine and then Jane. OK, so let's go to the next chapter. This is where we get one of the one of the good kings, one of the two hey. good kings. <laughs> Yay! Okay, Yay, going... finally. <laughs> In the third year of King Hosea, son of Elah of Israel, Hezekiah, son of King Ahaz of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he began to reign. He reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, son, uh, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the high places, broke down the pillars, and cut down the sacred pole. He broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the people of Israel had made offerings to it. It was called Nehushtan. He, he relied on the Lord, the God of Israel, so that there was no one like him among all the kings of Judah after him or among those who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept the commandments that the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. Wherever he went, he prospered. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and would not serve him. He attacked the Philistines as, long, as far as Gaza and in its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Okay, so what are some of the things that make him a good guy? He's not. He's an he's, idol breaker. He's an idol breaker. Certainly, that's yeah. important. What else? He he held firmly to the Lord to the law of God. Yeah, exactly. And he also rebelled against the king of Assyria. King of Assyria. Like he's not willing to be a vassal, at least not at this particular juncture. Okay. Now the bronze serpent. That might have been a surprise to you, but apparently in the ancient Near East. Um, a lot of uh, cultic objects that are snakes um, have been found. And uh, you do remember that there was a whole thing with um, serpent and and the uh, staff that, that Moses was holding. Remember when God was trying to convince him, listen, you have some uh, tricks up your sleeve and you can turn the staff into a serpent and all that stuff. So apparently all this time later, <laughs> they still have Moses' serpent. Yeah. Um, by the way, interestingly... I love the name Nehushtan because the word Nehoshet means bronze and Nachash means serpent. Okay. So it's like this cute play on words for the guy's name. I mean, the serpent's name. But they're obviously looking at it as a, cult, a cultish object and they're um, sacrificing to it. So that's really, really bad. Well, snakes, uh, snakes, not just there, but in many other cultures are emblems of eternal life because right. they shed their skins and so on and so forth. What about the snake in the Garden of Eden? Well, right? he died, did he? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, it's a powerful symbol, a right? A very powerful symbol. That's the guy um, that in, tricked us into being bad. Yeah. In ancient Egypt, it was a fertility symbol. True. Exactly. Right? So, and, you know, and in oh. Crete, you had the goddesses with their their snakes wrapped around their their arms mm -hmm. as an emblem of fertility and eternal life both 
Uh, that's what I was going to oh. say. I thought the snake was a symbol of eternal life because it keeps shedding its skin. That's, and it, that's yeah. what Christine that's said. What going. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but I didn't it, realize it had these other connotations yeah. of fertility. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Um, okay, Jason, you want to? Oh, no, I was going to note that there's a, um, there's a lot of ongoing stories that say that the staff survived all this time and that there's lots of places that have claimed to have the staff of Moses through the years. Uh, right. Same as like Solomon's ring. There's I did some research on relics for um, a briefly. I was working on a, a, a for a friend who was producing a TV show and we were researching sacred relics around the world and seeing which ones might still have plausible stories we could turn into an interesting storyline for a yeah. show uh, of somebody trying to find you know the various places that claim to still have them and but i i believe there are you know places all over the world that have claimed to have this object in their museum or in their you know temples that was the the, the real staff of moses so it's interesting how this story here says definitively it was broken but yet it has remained a thing that people claim exists interesting you know, umberto echo wrote this fantastically funny novel called bardolino not one of his better known novels but it's about relics and the uh creation of relics as a as a an industry <laughs> a cottage industry <laughs> uh, <laughs> around the, the, the crusades and other things i mean Echo was incredibly funny. And so he has this whole thing about these people being sent away by the Pope, you know, just like go die in the near, near East. And, and, uh, and they, they basically, they were sent in search of Prester John and Mar Bartolino is uh, entrepreneurial. And he basically decides that the way of surviving in this like horrendous mishmash of everything was to sell relics, you know, that there's a ready market and uh, <laughs> and he this was- This is the real thing, thing, right? Hey, you know, so it, it's a very funny novel and uh, I recommend it to you, Bardolino. Thank you, thank you. That's very funny. But, you know, notice that this whole history that we've been reading, um, not really since Joshua, but Judges and then the two books of Samuel. And now we're almost ending the second book of Kings. It's all about this constant effort to tear down the high places and the poles and the, you know, all these other altars to try to centralize the cult in, uh, you know, in, in Jerusalem. And it just like, it's, it's a hopeless cause. It's like the do. myth of Sisyphus, yeah. you know, every time they tear it down, it gets back right back up, which, you know, is sort of a commentary on, humanity really right we try to resolve problems like disparities in wealth right and then several decades later we're back to the same problem again right who but said also, that just i mean both versions of everything are eternal i mean they were <laughs> it's yes. what people do <laughs> exactly exactly but like, it's, it's a little disconcerting to get the sweep yeah. and to see how hard it is you know to um to be as good as possible. Um, okay, but uh, let's continue. Okay. All right, here we go. Okay. In uh, the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of King Hoshea of Allah of Israel, King Shalmaneser of uh, Syria came up against Samaria, besieged it, and at the end of three years took it. In the sixth year of Hezekiah, which was the ninth year of King Hosea of Israel, Samaria was taken. The king of Assyria carried the Israelites away to Assyria and settled them in Hala, on the Habor, the river of Gozan, and in the cities of the Medes, because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant. All that Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded they neither listened nor obeyed. So, you know, to be fair in terms of the issue of justice, which we were talking about before, I mean, the covenant with God was not just to be loyal to God, but I mean, the covenant does include treating the vulnerable, you know, well. It's just that it's never emphasized here. It's only emphasized later when we get to the bigger bigger books of the prophets. Yeah, Jane, go ahead. Um, Just the geographical or uh, historical point 
the Metis are uh, Iranians. And this is where uh, Midian was in the time of uh, Moses. Hmm. Right off the, uh, it's on the east coast of the Gulf of Aqaba. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So now we're going to see what happens to Judah. So, um, okay. In the 14th here. year of King Hezekiah, King Sennacherib Harib of his of Assyria came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. King Hezekiah of Judah sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Withdraw from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will bear. The king of Assyria demanded of King Hezekiah of Judah 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasuries of the king's house. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the doorposts that King Hezekiah of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rab Rabshake with a great army from Lachish to King Hezekiah at Jerusalem. They went up and came to Jerusalem. When they arrived, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is on the highway to the fuller's field. When they called for the king, there came out to them Elahim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joad, the son of Asaf, the recorder. Thank you. Okay, let me just uh, point out a few things. Um, so this campaign by Sennacherib, is attested to in the um, annals of uh, Assyria. So it's not like this is some made up thing that this really did happen apparently. I mean, the details are, are you know, open to question, but so there was this assault by Sennacherib. Um, and then of course, Hezekiah here after rebelling against the king of Assyria is now willing to pay him tribute because what, what choice does he have? And of course, again, you know, dismantling the, the temple and taking away all the, you know, beautiful things from the temple. Um, also, by the way, a lot of this material that we're reading right now reappears in the book of Isaiah. Oh, um, Isaiah is the uh, is the prophet here. And um, so we're going to read a very similar thing, which I, I somehow, you know, in all these years didn't realize. I mean, it's like verbatim, the same story. Um oh. Also, the three names, Tart, it sent the Tartan, the Rabsaris, and the Rabshake. So apparently Tartan is a vizier, the Rabsaris is the head eunuch, and the Rabshake is the head steward. Okay. So those are the people that are coming. Um, all right. So Rabshake said to them, say to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, on what do you base this reliance of yours? Do you think that mere words are a strategy and power for war? On whom you now do you now rely that you have rebelled against me? See, you are relying now on Egypt, that broken reed of a staff, which will pierce the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who rely on him. But if you say to me, we rely on the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and altars Hezekiah has removed, saying to Judah and to Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem? Come now, make a wager with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to set riders on them. How can you repulse a single captain among the least of my master's servants when you rely on Egypt for chariots and for horsemen. Moreover, is it without the Lord that I have come up against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Okay, so now you have a slightly contradictory thing. The timeline is not always so clear here because we just read that Ezekiah was paying tribute to uh, the king of Assyria. Now we're reading that he's not, that he's made some sort of an alliance with Egypt 
but it's pretty pathetic. And um, so the reed, the reed as a metaphor for Egypt is um, it can provide support, but it breaks easily if you lean on it. And then the jagged pieces can puncture your skin. So that's what Egypt is in this, in this view. And um, also the rebellion that Hezekiah is trying to, to, to mount is so pathetic that even if he were given these horses, right? I could give you 2000 horses. He can't even find the people to ride them. So really and truly he has no option here, right? And as a matter of fact, what we'll, you know, we'll never get to this, but in the later prophets, the prophets are always saying to the, uh, to the kings, don't play political games. You know, God will take care of it. Like, don't try to set up alliances with this one or rebellion against that one or whatever, you know, because you play the political game, you're never going to win because it's not up to you. It's up to God. But we may get to that one day. I don't know. Melissa, yes. Isn't this just like Israel making a deal with the UAE and um, you know, the Abraham Accords? Um, I mean, it's no different. Well, or, in some ways, I mean, this is about this is about survival, which yes, the Abraham Accords are to some extent about survival also, but it's about yes. other things. Yeah, I guess. I mean, yeah, I, I guess that's what you know countries do. They try to you know figure out what is it that I can do to survive, right? And mm -hmm. um, exactly, yeah, you know, yeah. The alliances the, in the Middle East are one of the things that clearly the Israeli government has decided would inure to their benefit in the long term. But it's hard yes. to tell. Yes. It's, uh, um, it's a, what do they call that reed? The Egyptian was a thin reed or a, a, a reed. You guys just, yeah. Yeah. It was a broken a reed or weed, a broken weed. Reed. Listen, you can sign a treaty. It doesn't mean you're going to follow it, you know, okay. right? I mean, yeah. Hitler didn't follow his treaty and uh, many other countries don't follow, you know, or a new, a new leader comes in and says, Hey, we're out of it. Right. Oh, like no, nope, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyone else have a comment? Let's see. No. Okay. So let's go back. Then okay. Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, Shebna, and Joah said to the Rabshake, Please speak to your servants in the Aramaic language, for we understand it. Do not speak to us in the language of Judah within the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But Rab Shake said to them, Has my master sent me to speak these words to your master and to you and not to the people sitting on the wall who are doomed with you to eat their own dung and drink their own urine? Okay, so let's just stop for a minute. So basically, they're speaking, you know, in the language of the people here, right? As opposed to the Aramaic language, which was Aramaic was sort of the more the diplomatic, you know, language. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, they don't want to have the people hear what this guy's saying to them, because the guy's saying, look, your rebellion is useless. You're going to die. And what does it mean that they're doomed to eat their own dung and to drink their own urine? A siege. The siege, right? And they there's no food and there's no water. Um so they're actually, you know, going to be reduced to this horrible level. But they don't mind speaking the language of the people because they figure they might as well know what's going on. Then, okay. the, then the Rabshake stood and called out in a loud voice in the language of Judah, hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, do not let Hezekiah deceive you for he will not be able to deliver you out of my hand. Do not let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord by saying the Lord will surely deliver us and this city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make your peace with me and come out to me. Then every one of you will eat from your own vine and your own fig tree and drink water from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive oil and honey, that you may live and not die. Do not listen to Hezekiah when he misleads you by saying the Lord will deliver us. 
Has any of the gods of the nations ever delivered its land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hina, or Hena, and Eva? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who among all the gods of the countries has delivered have delivered their countries out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? But the people were silent and answered him not a word, for the king's command was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, son of Hilkiah, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told them the words of the Rabshake. Thank you. Okay, so um, so earlier, this guy, Rabshake, let's go up a little bit, verse 25, uh, the Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. In other words, what he's saying is, Assyria is being sent by God to conquer you. Okay, but now he's changing tactics because now what he's saying is um, in uh, 30, let's see, um, do not let do not uh, let Hezekiah make you rely on the Lord, but saying the Lord will surely deliver us. Do not listen. OK, so in other words, here he's saying that God does not have the power to defeat the king of Assyria. So he's tried these two different tacks for uh, convincing him that there's no hope. Um, and then, of course, in verse 31, that they're going to eat their their vine and their fig tree, right? It's, of course, in contrast to the idea of these people sitting there eating their turds and their urine. Um, it's it's a, an image of peace and, and of course, of food. Um, and then... Uh, Oh, yeah, the, the, the way that um, the land is described down here, a land of grain and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of olive and honey, right? This is sort of describing the promised land, except it's yeah. somewhere else, right? It's not going to yeah. be in Israel. Just taking that same imagery. So okay. it sounds pretty pathetic, doesn't it? So let's see what happens. Because Hezekiah is the good king. Good okay. things are supposed to happen, but they're not. I mean, bad things happen to bad kings, but bad things are happening to good kings also, right? And here comes Isaiah. All right, Jane. When King Hezekiah heard it, he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, who was in charge of the palace, and Shebna, the secretary, and the senior priest covered with sackcloth to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They said to him, thus says Hezekiah, this day is a day of distress, of rebuke, and of disgrace. Children have come to the birth, and there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God heard all the words of the, Rab the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord... Hello? Uh-oh, <laughs> what happened? Sorry. I don't know. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. It may be that the Lord your God heard all of the words of the Rabshakeh, uh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to mock the living God and will rebuke the words that the Lord your God has heard. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant that is left. When the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah, Isaiah said to them, Say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Do not be afraid because of the words you have heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have reviled me. I myself will put a spirit in him, so that he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. I, I apologize. I was trying to find um, Isaiah because I want to show you that it's the same exact. Oh. Um, hang on. Uh, let's see. Can you see? Uh, yeah. 
You can see this, chapter 37. Yeah. Uh -huh. Look at this, exactly the same. When King Hezekiah heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth, etc. He sent to Eliakim, da, 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 da. This is what it has. It's exactly, exactly the same material. Yeah. It's so strange, you know? Um, anyway, I just want to show you that. So um, here, you know, all of a sudden, like, okay, don't play any politics. Just behave yourself and God is going to take care of this, right? Mm -hmm. And they start off when they talk to Isaiah in a sort of poetic way, because um, Isaiah is a literary poet. I mean, prophet. He's not, you know, someone who just speaks in a crude way. He's got very elaborate language. So they try to match that when they go talk to him. Here we go. The Rob. I have a really quick question. Sure, sure. Um, when I was a kid and I was a Christian, we read the Revised Standard Version. Mm -hmm. Is this the new Revised Standard yes. Version? Yes. So they revised it again? I think they took out things like thou and, you know, those kinds of uh -huh. things. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, it is. Thank you. Yeah, as I've said, the reason I picked this is because the ones I found that, like, if they have Hebrew, then it's very awkward, if, you know, to, to read it on the screen because you've got the Hebrew and then you've got the English, and I don't like the translations as much. Um, so this one seemed to be the most uh, accessible uh, and easiest to read. So even though it is Christian, but it's the same Bible. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I used to read all this stuff when I was a kid. Yeah. What did you think? Did it scare I, you? I thought it was fascinating for one thing. I read constantly. My father used to say, if I found someone I liked as much as my books, I'd be in good shape. <laughs> and uh, so my mom used to take me to the library, the old public library in Palos Verdes. And I would come home with 10 or 11 books a week. Wow. And uh, when I was really interested in this, the children's librarian found some stuff for me to read. Um, I found it fascinating. Um, some of the stuff about the sacrifice really grossed me out. Yeah. Well, how about the, some of the things we've read about the guy with the um, hemorrhoids? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've had some pretty ghoulish stuff. And the stuff about how they treated the women was, even then was really hard for me to stomach. When, oh, and by the way, in this verse, it said something about that the uh, um they that the children when the women were pregnant they didn't come out yeah so like there was did the women die do you think well or did if they, they can't carry and they didn't have doctors to treat right. oh yeah that's why so they many had women... midwives yeah a lot of women died in childbirth as you know um, and probably a lot of them weren't able to have children either that's possible. Well, there's such an overemphasis in the Bible about women having children and the value of women totally tied to being able to procreate. You know, this is Sarah, you know, here she is, God blessed her and Abraham when she hadn't been able to have children for so long. And I'm sure it's no different than now. I mean, even with modern medicine, the um, maternal mortality is still really high in some states. Mm. Okay, Christine? The U.S. More, uh, uh, maternal mortality rate is the highest in the industrial world. That's right. That's right. Yes. And um, But I was actually getting back to the hemorrhoids. <laughs> <laughs> and I still think that whoever does this is on to something. Convince Tiffany to come out with a, a line of pe uh, pendants Gold hemorrhoid, hemorrhoids. gold hemorrhoids. I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, that's I think great. They would sell if you just didn't tell people what they were. <laughs> that's funny. Okay, so who was reading? I was reading. I'm not okay. sure where we are. Uh, <laughs> I think right here, verse eight. I don't know if we're going to be able to finish this, but you go ahead. Okay. The Rob Shek K returned and found the king of Assyria fighting against Libna. For he had heard that the king had left Lachish. When the king heard concerning King Teraka of Cush, see, he has set out to fight against you, he sent messengers again to Hezekiah, saying, 
Thus shall you speak to King Hezekiah about Judah, of Judah. Do not let your God, on whom you rely, deceive you by promising that Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. See, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands, destroying them utterly. Shall you be delivered? Have the gods of the nation delivered them? The nations that my predecessors destroyed, Gozan, Haran, Rezeph, and the people of Eden who were in Talasa. Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, the king of the city of Sepharvaim, the king of Hannah? Or the king of Eva. Iva. <laughs> so Cush is Nubia, which yeah. is south of Egypt and probably linked with Egypt. And uh, Egypt was one of the key players in the rebellion against Assyria. Mm. So just FYI. All right, let's hear Hezekiah's prayer. Hezekiah received a letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Then Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord, the God of Israel, who are enthroned above the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to mock the living God. Truly, O Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands, and they have hurled their gods into the fire, though there were no gods but the work of human hands, wood and stone, and so they were destroyed. So now, O Lord, our God, save us, I pray you, from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Okay, so it's Hezekiah pray, you know, praying to God to help him out. And now we're going to get Isaiah, and it looks like a real Isaiah quote, which you will find also in the book of Isaiah. Okay. Then Isaiah, son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I have heard your prayer to me about King Sen Senarib, of Assyria. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. She despises you. She scorns you. Virgin daughter Zion. She tosses her head behind your back, daughter Jerusalem. Whom have you mocked and reviled? Against whom have you raised your voice and haughtily lifted your eyes? against the Holy One of Israel. By your messengers, you have mocked the Lord, and you have said, with my many chariots, I have gone up to the heights of the mountains, to the far recesses of Lebanon. I felled its tallest cedars, its choicest cypresses. I entered its farthest retreat, its densest forest. Let me just mention a couple things. This business about she wags her head or she tosses her head, that's a gesture of scorn, just FYI. And the assault against Judah is considered in verse 22 as an assault against God, the God of heaven and earth. And then here is Sennacherib boasting okay. about his ability. Sennacherib. Okay. I dug wells and drank foreign waters. I dried up with the sole of my foot all the streams of Egypt. Have you not heard that I determined it long ago? I planned from days of old what now I bring to pass, that you shall make fortified cities crash into heaps of ruins, while their inhabitants, shorn of strength, are dismayed and confounded. They have become like plants of the field and like tender grass, like grass on the housetops that is scorched before the east wind. So Sennacherib is boasting that he's been able to sink wells to exploit the water sources, and he has the power to dry, dry up rivers, right? And then nations are depicted here as mere grass blasted by hot wind. So 
just to kind of expand some of these metaphors. But I know you're sitting and you're going out and you're coming in and you're raging against me. Because you have raged against me and your arrogance has come to my ears, I will put my hook into your nose and my bit into your mouth. I will turn you back on the way by which you came. So in other words, Sennacherib, who thinks he's such a powerful uh, god, he thinks of himself as a god, is now depicted here as a mere beast who's being pulled by the nose. Um, so, you know, kind of really putting him down. Let me see how much more there is. Yeah, we, we can finish yeah, this. We can do it. And this shall be the sign for you. This year you shall eat with grows of itself and in the second year which springs from that. Then in the third year, sow, reap, plant vineyards, and eat their fruit. The surviving remnant of the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For from Jerusalem, a remnant shall go out, and from Mount Zion, a band of survivors. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into the city. Shoot an arrow there. Come before it with a shield or cast up a siege ramp against it. By the way that he came, by the same he shall return. He shall not come into the city, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for the sake of my servant David. So here is, you know, a sort of, there's going to be a famine. So here's how you can survive in the next few years, right? You you eat the remnant and you hang on to it and eventually the food will come back and a remnant is going to come back, which, you know, is kind of sad. It's only a remnant. And actually, by the way, when Isaiah first sees God and has his theophany and God says, you're going to go out there and be a, a, a prophet. What God tells him his prophecy is going to be is that the, you know, Israelites are going to be destroyed and there's going to be a tiny remnant that's going to come back. And I guess that is hopeful on some level, but it's pretty horrible on another level. All right, let's read the last few verses. Okay, that very night, the angel of the Lord set out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. When morning dawned, they were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, or however you say his name, of Assyria left, went home and lived at Nineveh. As he was worshiping in the house of his god, Nisroch, his, son, his sons, Adramelech and Sharazer, killed him with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ar. Ararat, his son Esar Hadan succeeded him. Thank you. So, um, actually, Sennacherib was actually killed about 20 years later, but it's written this way so that it looks like the you know fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy, right? These people are all going to be killed, and this guy, you know, the king is going to be murdered. And that's what he gets for attacking for attacking uh Judah and uh, God's people. Oh, I see there's some comments. Wait a minute. Uh, in the chat, has there been a discussion about how we will continue Torah when the rabbi retires? So that's a whole other question. Okay. I think it's safe. Yes. To that, oh, okay. Sorry. All right. So people are asking about a continuing. I'm assuming that whatever rabbi comes next is going to do Torah study. But, you know, I don't know how, under what form. Usually Torah study is the Torah portion of the week. And uh, we did that for a few years and decided to start going through the entire Torah. So, I mean, Tanakh. So um, any any last comments? Well, just you should have stayed another 15 years so we could get to the end. I mean, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm looking here and we're not even halfway through. So yeah, and it only took 10 years um. that you're just going to have to change your mind. because There's this is the most important thing. So it is. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, everybody. We'll have a great Shabbat and a great Jason, weekend. Jason, I know what she can do. She can just continue to do Torah study with us on Zoom. Well, I'm, I go for that. Do, she's free I'm, to do I'm anything. Yeah, with that. <laughs>
Thank you. We'll pay you. We'll, we'll pay. all miss you so much. Thank you very much. I'll miss you, but we'll we'll figure something out. All righty. See you. <laughs> see you soon. Bye. Bye. Shabbat shalom. Bye. Thank you. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Goodbye, Alyssa. Goodbye, Lori.